Good afternoon and welcome to Virtual Face to Face with President Bruce Jarrett. We haven't done this in a while. I'm Alex Lukowski, Assistant Vice President of Communications. The integration of big data with artificial intelligence and immersive technologies in healthcare is fundamentally changing the way we will treat patients, enabling us to vastly improve and personalize care for each individual. Now that was School of Medicine Dean Mark Gladwin almost exactly one year ago announcing the launch of the Institute for Health Computing. It's an ambitious collaboration between the medical minds at UMB, the computing power of the University of Maryland College Park, and the University of Maryland Medical System with the anonymized health records of two million unique patients each year. But IHC, as, it call, as it's called, is just one of the big things happening at the School of Medicine. In fact, if you want to keep up with Dean Mark Gladwin, the best advice I can give you is wear track shoes, and stay well hydrated because things are moving very, very fast at the School of Medicine. Two months ago, UMSAM doctors performed just the second ever xenotransplantation of a heart into a living human patient, advancing science that might save the lives of 6,000 Americans who die each year waiting for an organ transplant, and many more who don't even qualify to be on the organ transplant, transplant list in the first place. A major gift from the Collard Foundation, matched by UMB, has launched the Collard Institute for Addiction Medicine, Research there will focus on developing and testing novel interventions, including behavioral therapies, drugs, innovative technologies to reduce cravings and drug use and overcome the many complications of addiction facing Americans diagnosed with substance use disorder. And there were about 20 million of those last year. Another institute, the University of Maryland Institute for Neuroscience Science Discovery, or the UM Mind Institute, will accelerate translational research of the brain by facilitating interaction between basic and clinical science scientists and enhancing collaborative research. And then there are the individual discoveries and innovations, too numerous to list. Things like artificial blood, artificial intelligence, and medical imaging and diagnosis, exploring mRNA vaccines beyond COVID, and much more. Now, perhaps the reason so much is happening at the School of Medicine right now is because the mission is now so ambitious. And here's how Dr. Gladwin laid that mission out at last month's State of the School Address. I'm going to save him the time of going through the list. I'm going to go through it very fast. It's a big list. Address generational challenges by aligning our efforts across the tripartite mission, break down silos with innovative translational centers and institutes, advance and nurture fundamental and clinical science, embrace the potential of big data and information technology, address disparities in medicine, harness the power of data analytics to improve performance, train and recruit, in areas of unmet need, empower and support providers and faculty by increasing operational efficiencies and lead the fight for social justice, health equity, diversity, and integrity in science. Easy, right? Well, it's important to remember that the mission isn't just about what we will do, but what we will become. And a year and a half ago, then Dean Candidate Mark Lavin was interviewed by our own Claire Frazier at a gathering in leadership hall. If you become our next dean, she asked, what would faculty, students, and staff be saying a few years after your arrival about the culture that you tried to promote? Well, first of all, he replied, it would be a culture of passion and appreciation and pride that we are the luckiest people in the world to be here doing what we're doing. Now, on that enthusiastic note, let me welcome our guest, UMB Vice President for Medical Affairs and University of Maryland Medical School of Medicine Dean, Dr. Mark Gladwin. Now, a little later in the program, you'll have a chance to ask your own questions. Please write your questions in the chat area and I'll let you know when we're getting ready to call on you. If you want to remain anonymous, that's okay too. Just let me know that when you write your question. Now, please welcome our host, UMB President, Dr. Bruce Gerald. Thank you, Alex, and greetings to everyone there in the audience. You know, I've never heard Alex talk that fast. Alex, you're speeding up in life. That's a good thing. So nice to welcome you all here. Uh, we'll start out with a few questions for Dean Gladwin, but then move to the audience uh, as, as the questions come in. Uh, I think Alex is right to say that you got to run fast to keep up uh, with Dean Gladwin, but I want to switch to a slightly different topic first. So, you know, Mark, everyone here loves the Steelers. Uh, and uh, of course, here you are and where you love the Steelers. I'm sure everybody out there does. Uh, and my question really is, when you interviewed for the job, you had one idea about what Baltimore is. Um, now that you've been here for more than a year, uh, what's your impression of Baltimore now? What do you think about this city? What is the city of Baltimore about in your mind? 
Well, first of all, Alex, thank you for that lovely summary and introduction. And President Gerald, I do want to thank you for your mentorship. You know, these are are, are challenging uh, and fun jobs, but it's really nice to have a supportive, um, strategic, and experienced uh, leader above me. So thanks for that. Um, you know, I, I really, uh, you know, part of the reason I, I came to the University of Maryland was one that just to be part of a great public university academic medical center. Uh, it's such a, a remarkable place to be. And what's been created here from rich science to clinical excellence to educational excellence right here in Baltimore is remarkable. And when I, when, and, you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, on many retreats and meetings with, with academic business um, uh, and uh, public servant leaders in Baltimore. And one thing I've been impressed by about Baltimore is that in many ways we're a med ed city. You know, we obviously have Domino Sugar and a history of manufacturing, but in many ways with the University of Maryland at Baltimore campus, which has almost half of the biomedical research funding of all the University of Maryland schools, and then we have Johns Hopkins, just a you know a historic institution. Very few cities of the size of Baltimore have two biomedical research uh, institutions and clinical centers of excellence within the city itself. So I think one is we're a med ed city, um, and two we have incredible resources from the talented people. The two sports teams you mentioned, a great year for the Orioles, uh, looking like a, a great year for the Ravens. Um, so that that's a little bit of what I've seen so far. So my mouse would move there. So so, uh, but there must have been a surprise or two here in Baltimore. So what's been the surprises you've seen? Well, one of the surprises has been as I meet people, um, a lot of people don't really know what's going on in the University of Maryland School of Medicine or the University of Maryland Baltimore campus. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, what I've heard about xenotransplant. Everybody heard about that, but what else is going on? And, and I spent about my first three to four months uh, attending mini retreats where I visit our institutes, our departments. And just to remind everybody, we have 17 major departments, clinical departments, and programs like. The Greenabon Cancer Center, you know, uh, shock trauma, um, but then we have departments of neurosurgery, internal medicine, um, ophthalmology, and the list goes on. But we also have 25 uh, major institutes, like the Institute for Genome Science and the Center for Vaccine Discovery, and then we have basic science departments from pharmacology, biochemistry, physiology. We have about 25 institute centers and departments in the sciences. Um, and then we have so many trainees within the School of Medicine. We have a thousand residents and fellows. We have almost 600 students, not only medical students, but also physical therapy students and, and master's program students. Um, and when people, people didn't really know what was going on. And, and so I, I developed a list and I, I won't list them all for you now, a shock and awe list of just some of the exciting programs. And I developed a list that was more than 30, 30 long, things like xenotransplant, things like developing COVID testing that was, that was used for 20% of the testing done in the state of Maryland, leaders in vaccine trials, um, and it goes on. So I've just, I guess my greatest surprise was the, the wealth of very, uh, high impact science and clinical programs right here in Baltimore at the University of Maryland Baltimore campus. It's 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 a uh, pretty uh, pretty well uh, uh, formed and and I guess one of the questions is so what what's sort of the next step for this school in terms of let's start with research growth where where do you see the biggest advances forward. Yeah, great question, President Gerald. You know, I think one of our, first of all, for everybody after COVID, especially in academic medical centers, you know, there's a need to um, move from under the shadow of the great pandemic. And 
on the research front, it's, you know, we're, you know, people to some extent were isolated during the pandemic. Um, in the clinical front, everybody was in the clinic and working. So part of it is, is how do we leverage all this great success of these 17 departments and 25 research centers, but how do we come together um, to break down silos and to stimulate team science that, that will make an even bigger difference? And that's where Alex summarized these generational challenges. We've been looking at what are the things where we could really make a difference, you know, in the United States, internationally, in science by leveraging what we have and focusing that across the different departments and centers and institutes. And so one example is, is the brain itself. One of the great challenges of civilization is we're now trying to understand our own brain, which is one of the most complex things on the planet Earth. And, and just as an example, you know, how do we address fundamental diseases of the brain, like Alzheimer's, like autism, brain injury, brain inflammation, neurodegeneration. And so we've created an institute that crosses the clinical domains of neurosurgery, neurology, psychiatry, physical therapy, and then crosses basic science domains like primary and fundamental neuroscience, um, and then bringing those groups together in this transdisciplinary institute. So that's, that's one example. Another is an investment in addiction. You know, unfortunately, Baltimore uh, was the top city per capita this year in fentanyl overdoses. So uh, with President Gerald, we just had the opportunity actually this morning to tour our Center for Addiction Medicine in West Baltimore. We toured it with the Secretary of Health and uh, an incredible place where we're providing harm reduction treatment for our most vulnerable uh, patients uh, in West Baltimore. And the idea of this addiction institute, it's the Collar Institute for Addiction Medicine. This is gonna focus on basic science. How do we turn off addiction? How do we, how do we prevent addiction? clinical trials, how do we run clinical trials as we discover new things, and then cl excellent clinical care, which we now can project across the state. We have telemedicine addiction treatment programs that serve our jails and ser serve patients across the state. So those are some of the examples of how we're trying to break down these silos, bring our faculty together to address these big, big uh, problems that we face all the time. So you, you spent uh, 12 years at NIH and you spent a long time at Pitt as well. You must have had plenty of silos there. How, did, uh, how functional was NIH? Were there silos there or was that a collaborative environment? And if so, what was the secret to that? Well, I don't, I don't want to get in trouble here because I, I, <laughs> I love the NIH. And, and I, was, uh, I started there as a fellow in critical care in 19... 95. And in fact, I was a critical care fellow and, and our, when I, a little bit later on, our fellows started rotating in shock trauma and they still rotate at the University of Maryland today. So I always admired Maryland shock trauma. Although when I was a fellow, we didn't rotate here, unfortunately. Um, but the, the NIH, um, I think what was special about the NIH was the ability to do higher risk research because they had stable funding and that, that, that there was a focus on translation, you know, uh, identifying problems and applying very basic science to the solution of those problems. And, and for example, we're, we're actually collaborating to the Collar Institute of Addiction Medicine uh, with, with intramural NIDA investigators um, and very interested in partnering to create a NIDA node right here at the University of Maryland. Um, but one of the challenges at the NIH is it did get siloed in part because the funding ran through disease oriented institutes and you would have a fixed funding line. So, for example, I was a branch chief and I had the funding line for my branch. Um, whereas outside of the NIH in the extramural world, we compete for grants and those grants um, often to be more competitive for those grants will partner together and will conduct team science. So we'll bring together people in infectious disease, people in psychiatry, people in different domains, and as partners, we can address big problems. So I think 
there's some advantages here compared to the NIH in the ability to um, develop programs and funding around team science. The other big advantage we have is youth. You know, we have our training programs. Um, we have the medical school, the residencies, the fellowships, the grad school, postdoctoral fellowships. And as you know, President Gerald, we're just surrounded by young people. Um, and that, that's an opportunity that we have that the intramural NIH doesn't have. If we can leverage that talent, inspire them to pursue careers in translational research, you know, that's a big opportunity for us uh, that I didn't, that we didn't really have at the NIH. So you brought up education there. Let me ask you one or two questions about education. Uh, we're all seeing all these transformations. Uh, we saw it with COVID switching to online. There's now all of this uh, artificial intelligence going on. What do you think is going to happen to the education of our medical students over the next couple of decades in terms of how they learn, how we teach type of questions? Where do you see that going? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, the other thing we, we're seeing is sort of a transformation of the practice of medicine and related to big data and related to ad partnerships with advanced practice providers and, and more interdisciplinary care. You know, we're seeing an aging of our population. And one of the great generational challenges we face is what I call the aging epidemic. Some people call it the gray tsunami. Um, you know, about three or four years ago, more people born in the world. Uh, uh, there were more people in the world, I'm sorry, that were over 65 years of age than were under five years of age. Um, so we're hitting this remarkable change in the world's demographics, and that's even more uh, apparent in the United States. And so we're, we're projecting a less physicians as we move forward into 2050, less physicians than the need for the care of our aging population. So to address that, we're gonna have to change models of how we deliver care. And there's three important changes. One is gonna be big data and what we call population health. Using the electronic healthcare record, using data, probably using new tools like artificial intelligence support systems, trying to take care of a population that we care for and try to prevent hospitalization, prevent disease. And to take care of populations, not only do we need to new, use big data and technology, but we need health science partners. We're gonna work with pharmacists. We're gonna work with social workers, physical therapists. We're gonna work with nurse practitioners and nurses and navigators. And so the model of patient care for panels of patients in the future is gonna be teamwork and, and cross-disciplinary, which is another great thing about this campus. As you like to point out, President Gerald, we have a school of social work and we have a school of pharmacy. So that's a piece of the future of medicine. I think the second piece is the old model when you and I went to medical school was we memorized everything. Medical school was known for memorization and we would memorize everything. Well, now the, there's so much knowledge, it's so vast. Information is doubling exponentially so fast that our students can't know all these things. So they're gonna be relying on tools uh, like risk calculators and maybe AI support systems. Um, and I think the future of, we're gonna have to teach our students to use tools to access data as opposed to the old model of memorizing data. And it'll be tools different from just Dr. Google, I, I take it. How, how do you think Absolutely. the interface will work? Will you talk to yourself? Will you, how will you do that? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know, one of the things that's emerging that's really interesting, um, and we're gonna be piloting, we're, we're trying to launch this rapidly to pilot in January, but between the University of Maryland Medical System and the University of Maryland Medical Center and our, our physician faculty practice, we're creating a partnership to pilot this new AI chat box clinic assistant. And this system's called Nuance. It's actually a Microsoft um, product, but it's been heavily now tested. And we've already had two super users that are telling us that this thing's ready for prime time. And what this does is you, you'll see a patient in a clinic 
And if you've gone to the doctor recently, all the doctors are typing into the electronic healthcare record, and that's been really disrupting the physician-patient relationship, and it puts a lot of extra work on our doctors. They're typing notes, they're typing orders. Uh, many people spend two hours outside of a clinic day at night at home. The doctors call it pajama time, where they're actually typing their notes. Well, the new system would listen to you, and we would have our discussion and it's an AI program. It's been practicing on 30,000 patients and it will write the note and it will, the things that we talk about that aren't relevant to care will not be included in the note. The details relevant to care will be included in the note and that note writing system's already working, but I see a future where I would meet you and that system would renew your prescriptions. I'd say, you know, uh, Bruce, uh, if you need to renew those three prescriptions, do you want them at your pharmacy or what pharmacy? Okay. Um, I'm going to see you in a month. Oh, it's important that you get that x-ray and, and your standard lab test that we were last time. We should repeat those. And it will do all those orders for us. It will write the note. And, it, and then as it evolves, it may even look into all your past labs and tests to make sure I'm not missing something. And it may even prompt me to say, you know, I think you missed the this early kidney disease that's developing. So I think we're going to have tools that that might help us do a better job, not miss things, re reaffirm the patient doctor communication time that we've been losing. Um, so I, I'm, I'm I'm actually quite optimistic about this. So it, it won't be the uh, kind of divisive bones used on Star Trek. You remember that little thing? You yes. Push a button and get a diagnosis out of it. The tricorder. It, it maybe, you know. The you tricorder, know. right. Yeah. I, I just saw a lecture about um, chat GPT-4, which is the latest one that's going to be, um, I think it's part of Bing. Or, but chat GPT-4 now is making diagnoses. Um, you have to feed it the information, right? So you need... You know, obviously, that you're always going to need the clinician to talk to the patient, and you're going to need... Uh, that that trusting partnership so that we can share information, but these systems are able to diagnose, you know, rare diseases. And I think people, you know, maybe this could help with access that people are in areas without enough physicians. They may be able to look to some of these systems to answer their questions as well. Yeah, but there's there'll still be a doctor in the and or or a provider in the loop somewhere. I hope. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> So why don't you tell the group what the plan is for tomorrow, who we're going to hear speak and and uh, about that retreat. For the Institute for Health Computing retreat tomorrow. Yes. So we have um, we're really excited about this new Institute for Health Computing. I think, you know, this is um, has sort of a number of focuses. Um, one is how to working together with the University of Maryland Medical System. College Park with computation and UMB with biomedical experience. And these three groups coming together to try to develop what we call a learning healthcare system. Um, and the, the vision for this is that we have 2 million patients that we take care of, that they have their data and their clinical encounters in the electronic healthcare record. And we're going to be looking to develop the next level of care where in a very uh, encrypted, protected environment in which we work all the time, uh, compliant with HIPAA, um, we might be able to look at the data to find early kidney disease, things that we should be treating like cholesterol, high cholesterol, or hypertension in pregnancy, maybe identifying people at risk of substance use disorder. People that need to see a doctor, people that need help navigating care or maybe navigating preventive medicine. So we have an opportunity to, to advance population health. So the speakers tomorrow will reflect that, that vision and approach. We have three co-directors, three institute directors, um, uh, Sujal Biswas, who's the co-director from College Park, Warren D'Souza, who's chief information officer at University of Maryland Medical System, and Brad Marin, who's the the co-director from UMB, and those individuals are going to present this vision of how we can use what's called, from the College Park standpoint, it's immersive computing, AI, machine learning, large language model systems. How do we apply that to visualization of data and care? 
Brad Maron is going to talk about precision medicine. You know, how do we um, use all this data to try to provide better care? And then we're going to have uh, Warren D'Souza talk about the structure of this system and how they're using AI to improve clinical care. But but I'll just mention two other things. We have another speaker here, Disa Davis, who's going to be talking about how we can deliver better population care across Maryland. And as you probably know, there's a lot of disparities in the delivery of health care. There's regions, you know, based on zip codes where we have worse health care outcomes. So we think we have an opportunity with this new institute to touch everybody um, and independent of their color or where they live, making sure that they get the same equal access to life-saving new cancer trials, life-saving new therapies, preventive medicine. Um, and also there's a big challenge that we face about bias with artificial intelligence. You probably remember that when Dolly E came out, which was a, an image generating program using AI, when it drew pictures of African Americans, the faces and hands were distorted. And it turned out that the AI programs did not have enough images of African Americans to learn how to draw faces of African Americans. So we know that the data that you feed an AI program can introduce bias. So we think we have a sort of an opportunity and a moral obligation to, to partner with the patients in Maryland. And we take care of 1 million African American patients across the state. And that data can be used to make sure that these new AI programs that are going to be launched are free of bias and that are effective for everybody. So we're going to hear from Issa Davis about that tomorrow as well. Well, one of our speakers is going to be the uh, head of Amazon's uh, AI program. I wonder what he's going to tell us. What do you think? Well, um, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that lecture. Um, you know, I know that Amazon and Microsoft and all these large uh, companies with large cloud-based um, systems are have heavily invested in AI. Um, and I think one thing we're going to hear from them can, if, for, from this lecture is that th this disruption that's coming is here. And I say disruption in a good and a bad way. You know, disruption means the way we practice medicine, the way we we do science, the way we develop drugs, that this is now being disrupted. It's going to be different. It's going to be faster. It's going to uh, challenge us to leverage it the right way. It's also going to prevent, present risks to us that we're going to have to mitigate. So I think we're going to hear a lot about the disruptive power. You know, I, I there was a lecture from somebody at Microsoft at the, Ameri the, the AAMC meeting that, that I just attended with many of our educational deans in Seattle. And at that presentation, uh, they, they describe just how AI is gonna be transforming education, clinical care, diagnoses, um, all these elements of the healthcare system. And the point that the speaker made is, instead of creating a separate rail of healthcare, we need to think about how to, you know, in a value-driven way, embed these systems to do a better job with healthcare. Great, thank you. Alex tells me we got questions bursting at the seams. So, Alex, I, think, uh, I don't think I quite said that, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> the hyperbole is okay. Uh, we have questions, as you might imagine. The first one is really about AI, and there are more about AI. Uh, you mentioned that that uh, that the, the amount of knowledge, medical knowledge in the world, is just you know increasing it at uh, such a such an incredible uh, rate. Uh, this person from the School of Nursing asked, with so much of uh, the AI landscape yet to be explored and also growing and changing by the day, how do you keep up, how do you keep up with things? And what concerns do you have for the impact it could have on the physician-patient relationship? And are there privacy concerns? Yeah, yeah. So, I'm not sure if the question relates to how I keep up with medicine or how I keep up with uh, the impact or the uh, AI. AI. I think it's the AI. How do you, how do you, you know, just knowing the AI landscape, you were talking about Dolly, you know, how do you yeah. keep up with everything going on in AI? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to be fair. I'm not, in no way am I an expert. You know, I'd say that I'm, I'm fluent in the uses or applications and have been paying a lot of attention. Um, I did 
personally, very early on, download. You can, you can access for free GPT-4, Dolly E. You can pay a subscription to use the next level of Dolly E and the next level of these GPT chat boxes. I know that Bing with Microsoft is launching chat GPT-4, which you can, you can subscribe to. So it's very easy to go online and access these chat boxes. So I've played with them and I've encouraged my leadership team to play with these things, to understand them. And so, for example, you know, I've dictated emails into chat GPT 2 when it first, you know, the earlier version and asked it, you know, edit, um, polish and format this, you know, rambling email and it will provide this beautiful polished version. You know, I've, 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 I've asked it diagnostic questions. I've asked it very esoteric medical questions. So I've been playing with what it can do. I've also seen some of our programmers, you know, one of the powers of these AI chat boxes is they also, so what they are, they're large language models of generative AI, and they essentially can read and understand language. Um, and they can also, of course, understand math and data. Uh, but these systems are essentially have at, at, at their fingertips all the written material available uh, on the internet and in any system they're fed, all of it. And they have a lot of the code, the computer code that's been written in the world. So one area people are using this a lot, and I'm told that a high percentage of code is written this way now, is that you ask the chat box to write the code. So write the code that would do this or that or this in Python, and it will write the code. Um, and I've been told that now at computer firms, they're often hiring the people that just check the code that the chat boxes are writing. So that's another thing. I've seen some examples and watched examples of how people are using it to write code. You know, for me, I, was, I never wrote code, so suddenly this could become accessible to me. So, and I've also played a lot with the illustration programs of Dolly E just for fun, but so, and then I've been really pushing to understand, you know, we met with our IT teams, as I mentioned before, it said, we want to be early adopters of AI scribes because we want to reduce the burnout of our physicians. So I think very early on, uh, I, I've been pushing to see that technology and I mentioned the nuance system. Uh, so those are some of the things I've done and, you know, of course, reading about it and and being part of the IHC, I hear from experts about the technology that, that that's hitting the horizon. Yeah, I think I think I would answer that question a little differently, and and to say, uh, watch the uh, young people around me, uh, and watch how they're using it and how innovative they are, uh, and of course listen to what they say, and you'll learn an awful lot. And my guess is you'll see the future of fold out before your very eyes. Of course, we want to do more than just see it. We want to influence it, but but uh, I'm sure I'll get a lot of ideas from watching them. Yeah, Alex, this, I mean, this, this is now hitting the, it's a tool so fast that there are devices now that, because again, these systems speak, they, they, they know they can read and listen and understand language. So there are now systems um, that a little stick will hear you speak in any language and then translate in real time in any language. And this GPT-4 model, it speaks and understands every language and every computer language and has access to almost everything written and every code written. And it's fast. Wow. Okay, Alex. Yeah, you have another another audience member is asking about the flip side. So we talk a lot about using AI in treatment, right? But what about in teaching? Because at the undergraduate level, you know, it's a huge problem using AI. But when you maybe in medical education, it's a whole different thing. How do you envision using AI in education? So there was a lecture at the double AMC meeting about this and there was a lot of examples presented and there was also a, a New England Journal review series on AI and medicine and an a piece that had to do with teaching. But, but one thing is the, um, the illustration that was presented in the New England Journal, but also at this lecture that I saw was that um, these AI programs are now passing this test. We have a test called step two. You know, to become a doctor, 
after the second year, you take step two, and it's it's the knowledge of medicine, of clinical medicine, um, and the basic science that's relevant to clinical medicine. Um, and they're complex cases where you're expected to, you know, second order answer. So they might present glomerular nephritis, but then the question is, what's your treatment? Um, and these AI programs now pass that test greater than 97% uh, uh, pass rate, very high scores on these tests. So the example that was presented was a case and the AI program would, would help answer the question, but then you, but would also provide an answer for why each question was wrong or right and the data. And at every level, you can go deeper. So you could ask it, well, why did you pick C? And it tells you. And um, then you can ask more questions and it could go deeper and deeper and deeper. And this example they presented, which is how it could teach to great depth. Um, so I think the other thing that's gonna happen is maybe our students will, will have to start teaching them more about what tool to use. You know, we kind of have this already. If you if you're admitted if you if you're admitted to an emergency room, and you might have a pulmonary embolism, we have multiple scoring system. Wells criteria, PERC, PERC plus, something called the the PESI score and the modified PESI score. Every PE patient now has like five scoring systems that help us. Should we admit them to the floor, to the ICU, or send them home with an anticoagulant? So these scoring systems are already overwhelming um, and the students use their smartphones, but I could see these assistant devices with risk, risk scoring and risk adjustment. And so probably we'll be using AI in, in education. We're gonna have to educate people how to use it. Um, but these are some of the thoughts, you know, the other, the other areas anatomy, you know, developing virtual augmented reality anatomy courses or virtual augmented reality um, surgeries. You know, could we, we're gonna get to the point very quickly and we already have models of this, but I think we're gonna see this advance where the surgeon could, the student could be operating right next to a surgeon, but isn't really in the room with the surgeon. So imagine in every surgeon, there's five students that are the assistant in some sort of AR, VR. Um, so I think things like this are gonna come very fast. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. There was, of course, the Turing test that was always proposed, the Wizard of Oz uh, deal, where could you tell who was on the other side of the screen? Sounds like we're getting closer to that. The, the prediction was 2029, I think. Maybe it's going to be sooner than that. So, Alex? Yeah. I, so, uh, back to uh, health computing, though, it, it, someone writes, is, uh, and I'm going to try to interpret this. So we're talking about health computing in general, using using the the big data uh, to to personalize or or develop precision medicine. But do you have some goals? I mean, you have to start somewhere. So are you going to do you have an idea of what you're going to target first? Are we looking for certain kinds of cancers, or, or you know how how will you go about making this a reality in the in the clinical side? Yes. Yeah, so we. So, you know, we're at the stage for the Institute of Health Computing where we're really we're recruiting thought leaders, the people that know how to work with these big data sets and how to leverage these advances applied to these data sets. And we're kind of focused on kind of four main areas. One is this augmented and virtual reality, which is a real expertise of College Park um, investigators and Dean Barshney is an expert in, in augmented and virtual reality. The other is population health. And we think we're very quickly, in fact, we already have a project with the Institute for Health Computing and our Collard uh, Institute for Addiction Medicine, where we're using um, the electronic healthcare record to identify people that are at risk for um, overdose and who have maybe infections that came from IV drug use and then identifying people that then could be accessible to clinical trials. So using the electronic healthcare record to identify patients that need an intervention or a clinical trial. Um, but, but I think very quickly we can take that to the next level doing risk 
um, analysis. You know, you could use AI systems to figure out who's at the highest risk of admission, who's at the highest risk of overdose, who's at the highest risk of developing kidney disease. And then you could have either, you know, clinical trials to try to change that or actual clinical interventions. So those sort of things are, are happening already. You know, one of the projects that's going to be presented tomorrow is a partnership with College Park and UMB on what we're calling climate medicine. They were able to look at data from College Park on all of the smoke, the particulate levels during the Canadian fires. And they married that data set geographically to the electronic healthcare record data on cardiovascular pulmonary hospitalizations and clinic visits. And they saw that during that peak wildfire, there was more hospitalizations. And so now you can imagine using that data to pinpoint during the next fire, who should we be mailing an, a, a asthma treatment inhaler to? Who should we be uh, reaching out with a telemed visit, preventive medicine telemed? So we don't have that, that childhood asthma, which as you know, is a huge, a huge medical problem, especially among African-Americans um, in uh, uh, challenged socioeconomic regions. Alex, well, if you want to take a break from the the, the hardcore, the sciencey questions, uh, we do have someone who wants to know what's the biggest surprise you've encountered since coming to the School of Medicine. Biggest surprise, um, I would say, uh, one of the biggest surprises was again the the remarkable depth of elite science um, and clinical programs that we have here. Um, again, I feel like University of Maryland uh, is a humble place and people I don't think have, have um, shown off or promoted these, what, the depth um, and breadth of, of these discoveries. And just, you know, for example, you know, we were number one in the nation for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation during the COVID pandemic. You know, that's sort of an, a blood oxygenator to keep you alive with COVID pneumonia. And we had the second best outcomes in the nation, despite having the sickest patients. We had, you know, we were one of the main sites for multiple vaccine trials that led to approvals. We're leaders in the world in what's called exposure vaccination, where we have normal volunteers that get exposed to Shigella or Salmonella, and we test rapidly whether a vaccine worked, and then those vaccines have gone to clinical trials, and we're leaders in these enteric pathogen vaccinology research, things like Shigella and Salmonella and Campylobacter, you know, that are just devastating um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have, you know, underneath one of our research building, we got, we have all these incredible NMR machines for, to look at microstructure of proteins. Uh, we, 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 you know, the list goes on and on about the, the real exciting science. You know, we talk about addiction, on this campus, we have we have forty million dollars in grants targeting addiction, from alcoholism to fentanyl to overdose to um, nicotine, and that forty million at sixty unique grants. And so there's such such a wealth of strong science here. So, and part of my job is to really communicate the success of the faculty and and call that, you know, to people's attention. Alex. All right, a non AI question. So COVID, um, this person writes, opened the door wide to telemedicine. Is that door going to stay open or maybe open wider or how is it going to change? What, what are we doing with telemedicine? Great question. I just. Why are you laughing, Dr. Gerald? <laughs> yeah, I, I just had a call yesterday afternoon from my chair of psychiatry, Dr. Rock Beisel, who was driving back from a meeting with a major company. Um, that wants us to help provide tele, telemental care, telemedicine for health, for uh, mental health. Um, and so we, we have very large telemedicine programs. For example, we provide telemedicine care for substance use disorder in all of the jails around the state. We have telemedicine contracts for mental health. We have, well, you know, just in neurology, we launched a program where if a doctor's in the clinic in neurology and there's an open slot because someone canceled within 48 hours 
we're going to plug a telemedicine visit in so that we create more access to neurologists because there's just a shortage of neurologists and so many people need to see a neurologist for migraine or multiple sclerosis or or other major you know challenges they're facing so we we uh we've really been pushing that we want to keep telemedicine open i would say that there's always been this concern that medicare support or cms support for telemedicine may go away after after the pandemic but what telemedicine's done is it's it's really opened the door there's many people that struggle to get access into an academic medical center and as our population ages it's going to be even harder to come all the way into a hospital and uh, sometimes when you do telemedicine you get to see the home environment you know where are your medicines do you have a risk of falling in that environment um you know how how you know you can kind of really assess how people's the quality of health it's like a, it's like an office visit in the olden days so I'm confident that CMS is going to continue to be completely committed to telemedicine and that te telemental health is going to continue to explode as a discipline. And I think we have to uh, be committed to that in our in our faculty practice as well. You know, I, I was lucky enough to visit a, um, a sort of a telemedicine site run by Dr. Weintraub uh, out on the shore uh, where, you know, people who have a very difficult time getting to you know, a, a physician or getting to an addiction specialist, they have a van they can get to. It's a lot closer, travels around. And wow, the people there, they couldn't say enough good things about uh, how it keeps people in treatment. They're not they're not dropping out. They're not missing their meds. They're they're staying in treatment. So uh, that's certainly a success story that I assume we'll build on. Absolutely. All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, Oh, a question about the new cancer center. Now, I know that's the hospital and not us, but what can you tell us about what's going to go on in this, what's now a big, big hole in the ground uh, that will be this uh, new cancer center? Yeah, well, first of all, I would say the hospital is us, that we are, you know, we're the University of Maryland Medicine, this, this hospital, uh, we have an affiliation agreement where only the, the University of Maryland faculty work. This is the flagship hospital for the University of Maryland medicine system and uh, only only our faculty physicians work there. And in fact, the hospital supports a lot of the research at UMB. So it's really a partnership um, and uh, we're really, you know, a, and the design of the hospital really was uh, in large part uh, supported or partnered with our cancer center. And, and President Gerald may actually have a little more knowledge about that because I came in as the, the, the ground was being cleared and the plans have been made. But in general, um, that that tower is going to have cancer care. Uh, it's also in the top floors uh, going to have a, a new uh, department focused on rehabilitation. And that will be very important because not only the rehabilitation of our patients with cancer, but also with shock trauma, um, we have an in incredible need to support our communities in terms of spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury. And so a piece of that stolar uh, a tower for advanced medicine will focus on rehabilitation. President yeah, Gerald, did you want to of, add anything about the stolar building? I think that part of the um, concept here is that rehab medicine, particularly for the shock trauma patients, will be able to take place right in that uh, building as opposed to being moved out to uh, Kernan Hospital. And of course, advanced cancer care, uh, Mark, but you might mention your recruit for the director of the cancer center and where that's going. Because for those of you in the audience, uh, I, I'm sure you'll appreciate that the comprehensive cancer center that Dr. Kevin Cullen and others have built uh, is doing very, very well. Uh, and uh, we now have a new director, Dr. Cullen, after umpteen years, it's got to be 15 or 20 years is stepping down. And so uh, you want to mention a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so we're one of 51 nationally national uh, NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers. And in about a year and a half, we have to put in our renewal uh, for that big cancer center program. So there's a real commitment between the University of Maryland medical system because we have cancer centers, for example, at Capital Region, and we have a cancer tower there. There's support from UMFC, where, of course, the Stoller, new Stoller Tower is being built. 
support from UNB, which is providing space and resources to renovate space in HSF3, and then support from the School of Medicine. Everybody's come together, and there's also a lot of state support for our cancer center. We receive uh, cigarette uh, restoration funds that are directed almost entirely to research and clinical care in, in can for cancer patients. And so uh, we all came together and did a major national search. And, uh, you know, we had more than 100 applicants and interviewed 20 uh, elite candidates and brought in uh, four finalists. Um, and we selected and we're really lucky that, that uh, he, he accepted uh, the prior division chief of hematology and oncology from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Tofik Awanikoko. Now, Tofik is a nationally and internationally recognized expert in lung cancer, which is really important to us because after COVID, our screening for colon cancer, breast cancer, cervical cancer all went back up to pre-COVID levels. But for some reason, lung cancer screening has not at all. So we're really interested in building our lung cancer screening. And he's already working on that. He hasn't even arrived here. He's also Nigerian American and he's very interested in our IHV Nigeria programs and whether we can build cancer collaborations uh, in the African continent and really leveraging what, what, what we've historically done in partnership uh, with Africa towards cancer now. Um, but we're really excited about him coming and uh, he's, you know, brilliant, energetic, um, entrepreneurial, and has lots of great ideas for how he's going to take us to the next level. And, you know, part of being an NCI designated cancer center is you have to really invest in basic science research and in clinical trials and clinical research and in clinical excellence. And so I've been thankful and appreciative of the support that I received from UMB, UMMS, UMMS, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, UMMC, the, the, the medical center, um, to support recruiting somebody of, of his caliber. Great. Alex? I only have one more question from the audience, and to, but there's still time. So if you want to write a question, you can do it now. It, it's, it is another AI question. It's a different take, though, which is interesting. Uh, this, this may be a social work person. I'm not sure who. Uh, I'm worried that new technologies like personal AI, which I think you mentioned, are going to work for the wealthy, but not for the poor or less educated patients. Will healthcare disparities increase as we get yes. into those technologies? That's a great question. And I think the bias issue that I mentioned is a big concern that these AI systems learn from the data they're fed. And so if we feed them biased data, and that can just be lack of available data, lack of a voice, that that information, the, the, the readout will be biased. Um, so that's one big disparity that we're worried about. And we think we have a big opportunity to correct that disparity here through our IHC program. Uh, the other thing, of course, would be, you know, affordability, the ability to use these tools. Um, and there is, there is a major challenge uh, around AI that surrounds something called uh, hallucinations. The, the AI systems, if they have the wrong data or wrong interpretations, they, they can strangely extrapolate or hallucinate and generate incorrect data. And we think it's likely that those hallucinations are going to be augmented in minoritized patient groups or populations, again, where the data is limited. And the end... And obviously, there's great risk these AI systems are going to capture um, biased written material, biased knowledge. And there, there's, you know, these AI systems have the significant potential for misuse on and, and dangerous use. I mean, we're very worried about our security. These AI systems will never sleep. And and if they're if they're directed to break through security and access private data, you know, that's those are things we're all worried about, um, um, that this can take this arms race of, of cyber attacks to, to a whole new level. So those are also concerns. But let me just say, I tend to be a glasses half full person. And, and in these lectures that I heard at the AMC, they were making the case that AI has the potential 
to limit some of these disparities. And for example, the example raised is clinical care in areas where you don't have access to care. So remember, the some of these these AI tools are being built into chat, into um, um, search operators and functions like Siri, Google, Bing, which are free systems. And these systems, as, as GP, GPT-4 and related systems get better and better and better, um, there's the opportunity that you could access information that might never be available to you. For example, online learning. You know, the Khan Academy is now unrolling an AI tutor. So if you don't have access to medical education, if you're in Egypt or you're in another country, uh, in Vietnam, you could probably access the highest level tutoring with these AI systems in the future. You could access diagnoses in a region. If you have a rare disease, you don't, your doctors don't know what you have. In any language now, you can access the world's historic literature around diagnosis and therapy. Um, so I think there's some possibilities that this, in some ways, could be a knowledge equalizer, uh, but Again, it's disruptive for good and bad reasons. I, I realize I sent Dr. Gerald a confusing note. What I was I was asking about, I'll just ask about is I, I learned recently that we have big plans for Davidge Hall. It's being renovated, it's being sealed up, it's got HVAC, and that I, I heard, and I just wanted to ask you, uh, that you have plans for even more educational uses of Davidge Hall. Well, Davidge Hall was built in 1812, and uh, up until this year, it sort of functioned like it was in 1812. Yeah. Uh, it's had very poor uh, air conditioning and air controlling. The roof has leaked. Uh, there's been water damage to the ceiling of, of one or two of the lecture halls. And um, we've been very fortunate to have the state provide significant support to put a new roof in, to put new HVAC in. It's a it's a seven or eight million dollar this year kind of project with other dollars still being spent on it. So I think it's going to be upgraded significantly and hopefully uh, it will be well suited to use in its original use and that is as a medical lecture hall. Um, it does have 186 seats, I believe it is, Mark. And um, so Depending upon the class size, we may or may not be able to use it. We'll have to see all of that. But uh, it's nice to see a, a, a wonderful old facility like that uh, get uh, rehab rehabilitated. The, it's interesting uh, for those of you who come up to my office or, or right behind Mark, actually, uh, is this diagram of, of Baltimore in 1815. And Davidge Hall is down there in the left corner, uh, the right corner as we're looking at it. And it's in the woods, uh, and uh, so uh, it wasn't used to this big urban environment. Um, but uh, in any event, I think it's going to be nice to see it rehabbed. So, Alex, what are, we're we're about out of time. Aren't we? we we are out of time. Yeah. All right. Well, Great questions, um, and I appreciate the interest. And Alex, I appreciate your um, your guiding me through this. Oh, it's not that I'm, I'm just excited by all the things going on. It's just, yeah. thing. I, I was blown away at your uh, state of the school. It was just, it just was a nonstop, you know, um, uh, advancement and accomplishment. It was very cool. So Mark, thank you for coming on. And for those in the audience, thank you for giving us your time. Uh, well, we have a, 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 a four or five additional other new deans. So we will find time to interview them as well. So thank you all and see you next time. All right, take care. Thank you.